Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, DNA mutations and repair mechanisms. Um, usually in the past, I used to uh, put them all um, in, in two different lectures. Um, I would have a lecture on DNA mutations and another one on repair mechanisms. But in this case, um, I've com just combined them, similar to what uh, Cooper's book um, has done. So we'll talk about mutations first, introduce mutations. So let's define what a mutation is. So a mutation is a heritable alteration or change in the genetic material. So basically we're talking about, for example, change in the base sequence of DNA. Now there are two types of mutations depending on where they take place. Uh, you can have somatic mutations and they occur in somatic cells, that is any cell containing DNA other than reproductive cells. And you have germline mutations, and they occur in gametes, sperm, and egg, and they are heritable. Now, the somatic cell mutations are not heritable. Uh, now, the, we can also define mutations according to, or classify mutations according to their size. So you can have micro mutations, and we're talking about small changes in the DNA, or you can have macro mutations, and usually they occur at the level of chromosomes. Now, there are different causes of DNA mutations. Um, overall, they can occur spontaneously or they can be induced. That is, you have an external factor that causes these mutations. Spontaneous mutations occur as cells sort of live, okay? So, so as they uh, reproduce, for example, or as they divide and synthesize their DNA, as they, met, as they metabolize uh, whatever molecules and so on. So they can happen, so things happen. Now, induced mutations is when an organism is exposed to, again, a mutagenic agent or a mutagen. Now, some of these mutagens can cause cancer and they are known in this case as carcinogens. So all carcinogens are mutagens, but not all mutagens carcinogens. So not everything can cause cancer. Now an example is ionizing radiation, but we'll talk about different types of mutations in here. So the focus here is on micro mutations. Uh, in the genetics part, we'll be talking about macro mutations. So there are different types of mutations that, that occur at the level of DNA. And the most common type of mutations is point mutations, which means that they occur at the level of nucleotides, single nucleotides. So for example, right here, you can have uh, a substitution re, uh, uh, mutation where basically instead of a CG, you can have an alteration where, whereby it becomes TA. So you have change of T, for example, and that would change the complementary nucleotide to an A. You can also have insertion mutations. So right here you can have, you can have insertion of a C, for example, and um, and that would create a G as well. Okay, so instead of uh, C T T, you will have C C T, and the other T also shifts. So everything shifts basically. Or you can have deletion mutations, so that the C is, uh, uh, sorry, so you have a deletion mutation, so basically you have a nucleotide that is deleted, which is this A right here is deleted, okay? Also, this causes shift of everything, uh, in this case, to the left. Um, you can also have deletions of a few nucleotides or long stretches of DNA, also at the level of DNA. You can also have insertions and duplications of few nucleotides or long stretches of DNA as well. Now, you can also have translocations, inversions of DNA segments. You can have large insertions and deletions, and usually these occur at the level of chromosome. Okay. So, one of the most common type of mutations that can take place is insertion of base analogs. Now, what an example is 5-bromouracil. So, 5-bromouracil can be converted to a nucleotide. 5-bromouracil looks like a thymine. 
Okay, so what happens is that a fibromyosal can be converted into a deoxyribonucleotide and it can be inserted into the DNA. Now, usually it pairs with an A. Okay, so yes, it's it's abnormal to have fibromyosal uh, deoxyribonucleotide in DNA, but it doesn't cause a mutation. But what happens is that fibromyosal can be ionized and it, it happens spontaneously and once it gets ionized and if there is replication then it pairs with a G. Now what happens is that if you have another round of replication then that would cause a permanent damage or permanent mutation whereby instead of having AT you would have GC. Okay. You can also have types of uh, chemical modifications of DNA, of uh, the, the nucleotides or the bases. So you can have deamination of cytosine and this can occur spontaneously. So when cytosine is deaminated, it gets converted to a uracil. Remember, I, I didn't ask you to memorize the structures of bases, but uh, it's nice to know these structures. So when you have deamination, it gets converted to a uracil. Now, it's not normal to have uracil in DNA, but if there is replication and DNA polymerase sees uracil, then it pairs it with an A. So instead of having uh, C, uh, G, C, you would have a U, which can be, with an, if you have another round of replication, it would be converted to an AT. You can also have um, cytosine methylated, by the way. Okay, so this type of modification, we will talk about it later on uh, in, in the course, in one of these lectures. Now, if methylcytosine is deaminated, then it gets converted to thymine, and the effect is the same as having uracil. Okay. You can also have adenine deaminated, so it gets converted into a molecule known as hypoxanthine, and hypoxanthine pairs with a C. So eventually, instead of having a T, you would have G, C in the DNA. Okay. So these are some spontaneous modifications, chemical modifications of bases. Now, it just happens as well that uh, purines in DNA can be removed. So the base itself, purine itself can be removed, creating apurinic sites or AP sites. And this happens, by the way, thousands of times in our cells a day, and they are usually repaired. Okay, so you can have a, a an AP site right here. Now, the thing is, when a, when if there is a replication and DNA polymerase sees a nucleotide that is missing a base, what it does is that it just adds any base uh, in in its place, hoping that it can be repaired later on okay so the whole purpose really of dna repair mechanisms is to let cells survive okay so cells don't like to die okay so they try to find a way to stay alive so they instead of uh saying oh well that's a mutation i cannot do anything with it so what it does is that it it puts anything in place of that mutated base or nucleotide uh in hope that it can be prepared uh, repaired later on. So, now there are different types of mutation uh, repair. There are different types of repair mechanisms in our cells, and we will go over them uh, uh, one by one. Okay. So, there is a protective um, mechanism in our cells uh, in in preventing errors before they happen. If there's anything harmful inside cells, these things are removed right away. An example is reactive oxygen species. So these are molecules that are basically oxygens, but they are hyperactive. Um, uh, example is uh, free radicals, free oxygen radicals. Now these free radicals, they are missing an electron. Like, in, like here, this one, for example, which is known as superoxide. Now, what happens is that this superoxide is very hyperactive. It's very reactive. It needs an electron. So what it does is that it can uh, attack any molecule inside the cell, stealing 
an, an electron from these molecules. Uh, so it gets relaxed, happy, but at the same time, the molecule that gets oxidized is damaged. So imagine if, an, if uh, this uh, superoxide attacks DNA, then DNA would be damaged. Similarly, uh, free radicals can also attack lipids and membranes, and membrane is damaged, and that would cause cell death, by the way. Okay. You can, another example is um, hydrogen peroxide, and, and, and uh, it's also a reactive molecule, and it can be removed by, enzymatically by an enzyme known as catalase. And by the way, superoxide is removed by an enzyme known as superoxide dismutase. Okay, so before superoxide or hydrogen peroxide cause damage to DNA, um, they get removed enzymatically. But let's say that things happen, okay, and, and damage takes place inside the cell. Uh, how do cells handle such damage? How do they repair in this case? So here's an example. Uh, you can have alkylation of uh, al you can have alkylation of guanine, and that would cause the formation of 6-methylguanine, this molecule right here. Now, abnormally, instead of having a GC, the methylguanine pairs with thymine. So if you have another round of replication, you would have a T in place of GC. Okay. You can also have um, addition of large molecule uh, uh, as shown in here. Uh, this is known as benzene apyrene. So it's large uh, chemical adduct, okay, chemical groups that can be added to DNA and they can also damage DNA. Now, the example of the methylguanine, by the way, it can be repaired. Uh, enzymatically as well by an enzyme known as methylguanine methyl transferase. So what happens is that the alkylation, the, the addition of the alkyl group, which is methyl in this case, is removed by uh, methyl transferase enzyme. So you can have direct reversal of uh, DNA damage. Uh, in now, let's say that the base itself is damaged. Okay, um, for example, let's say that you have creation of these AP sites. Um, let's say that the uh, base is damaged uh, and it has to be removed. Now, there are enzymes known as DNA glycosylases. What, what these glycosylases do is that they cleave the glycosidic bond that links the sugar with the base. Okay, so they remove the damaged base and this, this base can then be repaired, it can be replaced. And it is replaced by enzymes known as AP endonucleases. So let me give you an example. So let me give you an example of uh, the function of, of, of glycosylases. There's an enzyme known as uracil DNA glycosylase. This enzyme works specifically on uracil in DNA molecules. Now, it's not normal to have uracil in DNA. So what this glycosylase does is that it removes the uracil only, the base only, creating an AP site. Now, remember, if uracil stays in DNA, then you, and, and DNA is replicated, you will have UA, and eventually it becomes TA. So it has to be um, repaired. So the glycosylase removes the uracil, creating an AP site. And then what happens is that you have an AP endonuclease. So it is an endonuclease, okay? So what it does basically is that it creates a NIC, N-I-C-K. It creates a cut in the phosphodiester bond between these two bases, the AP site and, and the base uh, right before it. And then this uh, the deoxyribose is removed and a DNA polymerase comes in, it fills in the gap. Okay, so that's how repair takes place. Now, sometimes the damage can be um, uh, is, is extensive and it has to be uh, repaired. Uh, 
drastically. Okay, so how does you have excision repair mechanisms? Here's an example of a mutation that is repaired by excision repair mechanism. So what happens is that sometimes you have lesions in DNA as a result of UV light hitting DNA. So when UV light hits DNA and you have two thymines subsequent to each other, what happens is that you will have the formation of a thymine dimer. Now, let's say that this is not repaired and DNA polymerase comes in and it starts to synthesize DNA. Once it hits a thymine dimer, it stops. It cannot move forward because it cannot read these bases. Okay, so uh, this can cause uh, cell death, by the way. But there are other mechanisms of repair as well. So we'll talk about them later on. So what happens in, 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 uh, in bacteria is that these dimers can be removed uh, reversibly, okay, by enzymes known as photolyases. So they can separate the two thymines from each other. Okay. Now, remember that this mutation is actually uh, mutagenic, so it causes mutations. So let's talk about the the repair mechanism. So it is an excision repair mechanism. It's also known as general excision repair what happens is that you have a activation of a complex of proteins and this happens in bacteria by the way these proteins are known as uvra uvrb and uvrc so each one of them has a certain function collectively what they do is that they recognize the lesion they recognize the pyrimidine dimer then you have at the one of them cuts the DNA surrounding the dimer, and this piece of DNA containing the dimer is removed, okay? Creating a gap right here, a large gap. DNA polymerase one, okay, comes in and it fills in the gap, and this is followed by DNA ligase. Remember we talked about the different DNA polymerases in bacteria and I said that you have DNA polymerase 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I said that DNA polymerase 1, one of the functions of DNA polymerase 1 is DNA repair. So this is basically what it does. Okay, so it fills in the gap when there is one in DNA. Now, you have a similar mechanism in, in human cells as well. Okay, and... Uh, and defect in, in this mechanism or defect in these proteins uh, can cause a condition known as xeroderma pigmentosum, whereby you, you have um, these uh, freckles in, uh, in, in, in the skin, in face. And these are damaged cells, by the way, and it, cancer can result if DNA is not repaired. Okay, so that are involved in this general excision pathway are known as XP proteins. And there are different proteins known as XPA, XPB, XPC, etc., all the way to XPG. Each one of them is, in fact, a, a protein with a, a specific function. So you have one of them recognizing the lesion, you have another one that cuts in the DNA, you have a third that that degrades the DNA or you have a helicase as well and so on. One of these uh, proteins is known as TF2H right here, this one right here, which is uh, a, a, an abbreviation for transcription factor 2H. We will talk about this protein later on in the transcription lecture. So what this protein does is that it functions as a helicase. So when the DNA is cleaved, Okay, it is removed by the transcription factor 2H. Okay, now you have single-stranded DNA right here, right? And I said in the replication lecture that cells do not like to see single-stranded DNA because of a number of reasons, and I talked about these reasons. Now, and I talked about one protein, which is the replication protein A, that protects this single-stranded DNA, and it does the same thing here. So when this piece of DNA containing the, the pyrimidine dimer is removed, the replication protein A coats 
the single stranded DNA protecting it. So now you can have a DNA polymerase coming in, filling in the gap, and DNA ligase um, forms a phosphodiester part. Okay, we have mechanisms that are linked to transcription, which is synthesis of RNA. Okay, so what happens is that, let's say that you have an active gene and it needs to be transcribed, but it's damaged. Now the RNA polymerase, which is responsible for RNA synthesis, what it does is that it stalls, it stops, it cannot continue because there is damaged DNA. So there is a protein that recognizes um, that the RNA polymerase has stopped and it gets activated. Okay, and it works with other proteins as well to uh, repair the DNA. Now, the thing is, the protein that recognizes that RNA polymerase has stopped is known as CSB. The reason for this name is that it comes from a disease, a condition known as Cocaine's syndrome. And people with this condition has uh, very uh, uh, special features, as you can see here. You don't have to memorize these, by the way. Just, you know, just get to know them a, a bit. So what happens is that when this CSB protein that recognizes that the RNA polymerase has stopped, what it does is that it recruits all of the other proteins, uh, all of the other XP proteins, like the XPA, the replication protein A, transcription factor 2H, and so on, and these repair uh, the, the uh, DNA. Now, once DNA is repaired, then RNA polymerase can resume RNA synthesis. Okay, so let's say that uh, replication takes place right before DNA is repaired. What does happen afterwards? Well, a, a very important mechanism is known as mismatch repair mechanism. So what happens is that, let's say that the DNA polymerase makes a mistake, there's a mismatch, so instead of having GC in DNA, you have GA. Uh, sorry, you have GT. That's a mismatch. Now, there are proteins in, in bacteria that can recognize the presence of a mismatch. An example is a protein known as mute S, and it works with other proteins known as mute L and mute H. And collectively, what these do is that they recognize the presence of a mismatch, they create a single cut, and you have an exonuclease that removes this DNA. So you have a gap right here. You have single strand DNA binding protein protecting the single stranded DNA, and then the gap is filled, up, filled in by DNA polymerase 1. Well, let's say that you have a G here and you have a T on the other strand, the complementary strand. The question is, how do bacterial cells know which one is the original strand, which one is the correct base? Because the G nucleotide looks normal and the T nucleotide looks normal as well. So how, how do cells know which one of them is the correct one and which one needs to be removed? Uh, if so, so how do cells know uh, which one is the original strand and which one is the the um, the uh, newly synthesized strand? It's DNA methylation. So what happens is that original DNA strands are methylated. The newly synthesized strands are not methylated, and this methylation takes place at the adenine. Okay, there is an enzyme known as adenine methylase. What it does is that it methylates adenines. Now, the newly synthesized strand, as I said, is not methylated, and here you have a mismatch. Now, the repair mechanism, the mismatch repair mechanism, no, looks at the, meth the unmethylated strand, and it says, aha, this is the one that is new, so I should remove the mismatch from this newly synthesized uh, strand. So the T is removed, and it can be fixed. Okay. Now, once uh, DNA replication is done, what the adenine methylase does is that it methylates the newly synthesized strand as well. So now it is considered an original strand. Okay. So it's almost like you're copying a book. 
And once you make sure that the copy is fully identical as the original book, you can stamp it. So you can treat it as an original book in this case. Well, in humans, the mechanism is a little different, but what's important is that it is catalyzed by two proteins known as MSH2 and MLH1. And these two proteins are very similar to the bacterial MUTE-S and MUTE-L proteins, except that they do not function uh, after replication is done. It's not post-replication repair. Rather, it is as it is co-replication mechanism. So as replication takes place, uh, mismatches are repaired. So let's say that you have a mismatch in the leading strand. What happens is that these two proteins recognize the mismatch and they create a cut. They remove the uh, part of the leading strand and they start all over again, okay, extending the leading strand. Now let's say that you have a mismatch in the Okazaki fragment. Again, these two proteins recognize the mismatch they remove the part of the Okazaki fragment that, that contains the mismatch and uh, it's replaced by the Okazaki fragment that, uh, that has started right after it. Now the thing is these two proteins are really important because mutations in these two proteins, mutations in, uh, or, or defect, in these two proteins can lead to a type of colon cancer known as hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. Okay, and it, it, it uh, constitutes 15% of colon cancer cases, etc. But so let's talk about translesion DNA synthesis. Okay, what does translesion mean? It means jumping over a lesion. Now, what happens is that in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, let's say that there is a pyrimidine dimer right here. Okay, so notice that there are different ways by which uh, pyrimidine dimers are repaired. So let's say that you have a pyrimidine dimer and you have DNA polymerase 3 that's in bacteria synthesizing DNA. It sees a pyrimidine dimer. It cannot synthesize DNA. Okay, so what it does is that what happens is that it gets released from DNA. Now you have DNA polymerase 4 or 5 coming in, and what it does is that it jumps, it, it, it jumps over the lesion and it adds nucleotides of its own. Now the whole purpose is that to resume, to continue, to finish and complete DNA synthesis. As I said, cells don't like to die and they prefer to create mutations rather than die. So what they do is that they they add uh, this these polymerases, add any nucleotide uh, in hope of repairing DNA later on. Now this, uh, this polymerase is, is released and you have DNA polymerase uh, 3 coming over again, continuing DNA synthesis. So the, the thing is with this repair mechanism is that it has low fidelity because it creates mutations and these polymerases do not have proofreading mechanisms okay so they create mutations but but there is an important point in here is that these polymerases can assume that it is a pyrimidine dimer so uh, uh, they they add a's in play in 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 in, in place of these dimers okay so it's not always the case, but they more often uh, add uh, A's, uh, guessing that it's a pyrimidine dimer. So the rate of mutations uh, is reduced as a result of that. Now, sometimes the damage to DNA can be really extensive, okay? Such as having double strand. And this happens if you have uh, ionizing radiation hitting DNA. Now this ionizing radiation can create different types of mutations. It can create AP sites, it can damage bases, but often as well they can create strand breaks. So the phosphodiester bonds are broken up by these 
by ionizing radiation. Okay. Now the thing is, <clears throat> there is there are two repair mechanisms that can fix this problem, and these are co collectively known as recombinational repair mechanisms. And there are two types. <clears throat> One type is known as non-homologous end joining. So what this does, what these proteins do, is that <clears throat> if there is double strand break these two strands are glued together except that when they are glued when they are glued mutations can happen such as <clears throat> insertions deletions uh, and so on so yes it's a good system because it fixes uh, large damage in in dna but mutations uh, take place it's almost like if you have a base and this base is broken, yes, you can glue all the pieces together, but but uh, it would still look damaged and, and broken. Now, there's a protein uh, known as RAD51, like radiation, okay, RAD51, that is involved in this mechanism. In, 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 in the other mechanism, which is known as homologous repair mechanisms or homologous recombinational repair mechanisms sorry okay so the homologous re uh, recombinational repair mechanism what happens is that cells take advantage of having a homologous chromosome remember that that somatic cells are diploid there are two copies of every chromosome so what cells do is that they utilize they take advantage of the second copy of chromosome by taking uh, pieces of it, placing it in the damaged DNA, so now this the damaged DNA is repaired, and the uh, homologous chromosome with the pieces taken out, uh, it can uh, it can be repaired because the pieces are taken from one uh, one strand only. Okay. Now, the thing is. There are two proteins that are important for in, in uh, homologous recombination repair in, in human cells. And these two proteins are known as BRCA1 and BRCA2. And BRCA comes from the words breast cancer because these proteins have been found to be associated with breast cancer. So defect in these proteins, proteins leads to accumulation of mutations and these mutations can lead to breast cancer. So what happens is that you have BRCA1 that recognizes uh, the, the, the presence of double strand breaks, uh, the protein gets activated, and uh, it can be involved in, um, it, it can be involved in homologous uh, uh, recombination repair mechanism. It can also be involved, by the way, in uh, transcription uh, coupled DNA repair. Okay. So remember that's the, uh, this in terms of BRCA1. And BRCA2, by the way, functions with the RAD51 protein that I just talked about in the homologous recombination repair mechanism. Okay, so these are the four different types of repair mechanisms. That's what they do. You can read this on your own. And these are the important proteins in these mechanisms. Okay, so um, you have base excision repair. Uh, catalyzed by DNA glycosylases, and uh, what they do is that they remove the abnormal bases. You have nucleotide excision repair mechanisms, you have XP proteins and the CSB uh, protein as well. Uh, remember, CSB is also uh, associated with transcription coupled uh, repair mechanisms. You have mismatch repair mechanisms in bacteria, it's mute L, mute S, and mute H proteins in humans. You have the MLH1 and the MSH2 proteins, which are similar to the bacterial ones. And you have the post-replication repair mechanisms um, involving BRCA1 and BRCA2 in, in breast cancer, for example. And they do, and damage is repaired by uh, recombination. Well, let's talk about uh, a new technology known as CRISPR. Cas9 system. So, uh, 
what happens is that uh, let's define what CRISPR is and Cas9 is. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So these are sequences that are repeated. They are palindromic. You can go back to palindromic restriction sites and what the definition of palindromic sequences are. And they are short sequences. They are interspaced so that they are separated okay, um, by other sequences and they are clustered regularly. Okay, so they are present in part of the, the of bacterial genome. So CRISPR is a bacterial genetic system. And the whole system actually it, it functions more like the immune system of bacteria. Okay, we'll talk about it now. So Cas9 is a nuclease and it is a ribonucleoprotein, meaning that it's composed of a protein part and an RNA part. Okay, and this RNA guides Cas9, the nuclease, to a specific region in the in genomic DNA. Okay, and what it does is that it's a nucleus, so it creates a cut. Okay, now the idea here is that the CRISPR-Cas9 system protects bacteria against phage infection. So what is phage? Phage or bacteriophage is a, a virus that infects bacteria okay so what happens is that these viruses they insert their own genetic material into bacterial cells and they took take over the molecular machinery so they kidnap these bacterial cells uh, using uh, the uh, DNA polymerase to make uh, many many copies of the bacteriophage DNA and transcription translation to synthesize the capsid that is the cover of the the coat of of this virus and so on and 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 you have creation of hundreds of bacteriophages in cells eventually cells uh, rupture beneficial and these phages are released and they can infect neighboring cells and so on so what happens is that these bacterial cells have developed a a, a mechanism to fight these bacteriophages. So what they do is that they can degrade the DNA phage into smaller pieces using maybe restriction endonucleases. We talked about that before. And they take these pieces and they place them in their own chromosome. So let's say that he, this piece comes from this bacteriophage. This piece comes came from a previous infection this piece also came from a previous infection. So what happens is that the bacteriophage DNA is integrated into bacterial chromosome. So now let's say that there's an, another infection by another bacteriophage. So what happens is that you have a transcription of this genetic system, creating uh, pieces of what is known as CRISPR RNA. And they are cleaved so now you have something that looks like this okay so you have pieces of the bacteriophage DNA as part of a large piece of, R, uh, of RNA I'm sorry so you have a piece of um, of the bacteriophage uh, uh, RNA or, okay uh, that so it's complementary to, to the bacteriophage DNA and is part of a large RNA molecule now what happens is that this CRISPR RNA, or the guide RNA as well, can be integrated into the Cas9 protein, the nucleus. And the RNA guides the Cas9 to the bacteriophage DNA. Now you have this double-stranded structure right here, part DNA, it's a hybrid, part DNA, part RNA, and the nucleus cleaves the bacteriophage DNA, protecting bacterial cells from infection of this virus okay so this is really the biological function of the crispr cas9 system so again you have a guide rna okay and this guide rna is integrated into the cas9 system uh, the cas9 goes into the uh to the dna double-stranded dna and it makes cuts 
right here. So DNA is um, is cut. Now the thing is here. Uh, uh, the by the way, the uh, there are two female scientists who uh, discovered this mechanism, and I believe that they will get the Nobel Prize sooner or later for their discovery because. Humans, humans or scientists are doing wonders with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So what they're doing with this system is that they say, wait a second, if DNA is cleaved, then we can have uh, activation of the re DNA recombinational repair mechanisms, right? And I said that there are two mechanisms. You have the non-homologous injoining and you have the homologous uh, recombinational repair, right? So what happens is that if you have a double strand break of DNA, you will have activation of the non-homologous in joining, right? And that can fix DNA, but at the same time, mutations are created. You can have insertions, deletions, or frame shift mutations. So that results in, in, in the creation of a defective gene, and that results in the, in the formation of a defective protein. So imagine if you want, what, what scientists are doing is that if they want to understand the function of a gene, they mutate it, they disrupt it, and they see what happens to the cells. So let's say that there is actually a gene that causes cancer. Well, what if we introduce the, Cas the CRISPR-Cas9 system into these cancer cells, and this gene is mutated so it doesn't cause cancer cells anymore, okay? So that's creative, right? Well, scientists, what they did is that they engineered a Cas9 protein that can cause a single strand break, not double strand break. And that would lead to homologous recombination repair, okay? So it uses... Uh, it uses the other homologous chromosome to fix this DNA, right? Well, what scientists have done is that not only that they introduce the Cas9, this Cas9 into cells with the guide RNA, they also introduce the gene that they want the cells to use for recombination. So instead of using the homologous chromosome, cells would use the gene or the piece of DNA that cell that scientists introduce into cells. So scientists introduce both the Cas9, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, as well as the DNA that they want uh, to be inserted into the human genome. Okay. So imagine if you have a mutated DNA here, it can be repaired by introducing the normal DNA or let's say that you have a normal DNA here and can be replaced by a piece of DNA, a gene that is mutated uh, with a certain mutation and it can be replaced uh, into, it, re it replaced, it, it replaces the, the good gene. So basically both mechanisms, the function of a gene can be studied by mutating it. In this mechanism right here, by introducing the Cas9 that cleaves only one strand and introducing the piece of DNA that they want to be inserted into the DNA, a gene can be replaced by another one using this mechanism. So this is really creative. Okay, so many things can happen into cells. Yes, it is the molecular fingerprint, okay, but at the same time, uh, scientists have uh, have devised different ways of manipulating DNA. It's almost like um, like you know using different tools like hammers and and uh, screwdrivers and whatever to uh, to fix DNA or change DNA. And eventually, it is thought that DNA can be placed in a, a, a capsule, a drug capsule, and introduced into cells. Now. Let me talk about number of news. This is separate. This is not part of the lecture, just to spice up the, the, uh, the lecture itself. I'll, I'll talk about a different uh, news in here. So there is a, a, a new way of, uh, 
of fixing diseases in the mitochondria. So as we know, mitochondria have their own DNA. And if this DNA is mutated, then that can cause uh, babies born with a certain mitochondrial disease. And this mitochondria come from mothers specifically because they are, they are placed in the egg. And the contribution of the male is only DNA, the nuclear DNA that is. Okay, so there's no, there's hardly any contribution of my, of male mitochondria into generations. So what happens is that let's say that uh, you have couples wanting to have a baby, except that the mitochondrial DNA of the mother is defective; it contains a mutation. This has been uh, fixed by having a three-parent baby. This is done the, by the following by taking the, uh, the mother's nucleus, okay? And taking a donor's egg. And this donor's egg, the nucleus of the donor's egg is removed. So now it becomes without any DNA. Now, and the nucleus of the, of the mother that wants to have a baby is placed into the uh, the nucleus free egg in here now this nucleus right here contains the mother's um, nucleus DNA as well as the mitochondria from the donors cell so you have the mother's DNA as well as the the donors mitochondrial DNA and then this egg can be fertilized by the fathers the, this the, the husband of this mother okay of this lady so now you can have the fertilization of an egg uh, having three types of uh, of dna molecules you have the fathers you have the mothers and you have the donors mitochondrial dna and the baby the, the first time this was done the baby was born healthy okay so this had been controversial and it's still controversial actually uh, it was controversial in the uk because it, it was done first in, uh, er, the first time in in the uk uh, but not anymore uh, right now um uh, it's it's it has been approved to be done in the uk okay now in islam uh, the, um, i think that scientists um, or scholars So in Islam, uh, scholars have decided that this is not permissible, haram, and it should not be done. Uh, I think that maybe they should reconsider it, um, and they should take uh, some sort of uh, uh, precautions, or they can take uh, some sort of measures to make it halal and allow it. Because here we have it in the news. You have a Jordanian couple. They went to Mexico, actually, to have a, a healthy newborn without a mitochondrial da um, damaged DNA or mutated DNA. And this was done, when was it done? Uh, I don't know when it was done. Uh, I think 2016 or 2016. Okay, so I, I, I think that... Um, uh, anyhow, it, it is a controversial issue, but what's interesting is that it's a British developed technique. It was performed in Mexico by a Chinese American physician on Jordanian couple. Quite international, huh? Now, the other thing that is controversial as well is that is the scientist who applied for a grant. She got money to do a research on fertilized eggs using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And what she wanted to do was to mutate DNA in the fertilized egg to see uh, what the, the important genes that are necessary for fertilization. Uh, it's just for better understanding of uh, genetic factors involved in fertilization in hope to, to, to improve the in vitro fertilization or um, 
or, or to, to, to discover diseases and how to prevent these diseases. Now, the idea of using fertilized eggs is always controversial, but it was allowed again by the uh, UK system, UK Parliament or uh, court. The thing is, uh, it was uh, frightening to think of human scientists um, manipulating human DNA and um, and and having uh, people born with uh, modified DNA and this was actually done last year by a Chinese scientist and what he did is that he used the CRISPR Cas9 system to uh, to damage a gene known as CCR5 and twin sisters were born with this modified uh, DNA. Now, this scientist, by the way, was jailed for three years. He was suspended from work. And, and what happened, the whole world, uh, scientific world, went into turmoil. And, and there was a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion about what he did. And what he did was really unethical, because we don't know what the implications of what he did uh, were because the CRISPR-Cas9 system is not 100% accurate. It can damage DNA uh, in different places, by the way. But the thing is, we also don't know what CCR5 protein does. We know it's a, it's a, it's a membrane protein. We know that it allows the HIV virus to get into human cells. So the, by damaging CCR5, these two girls are protected against HIV. But at the same time, by the way, is that having defective CCR5 increases intelligence, by the way. I don't know why, but it seems to be, it seems to, to, to have an effect on intelligence. So they, he probably had their brains enhanced. We don't know that, okay? So there's still a lot of work to be done, but CRISPR-Cas9 should not be uh, approved on humans so far. So, this is uh, the DNA repair and mutations lecture.